Russian Legium Society a webinar, the first one for the new year. I'm uh, very happy to be here with our uh, guest today, which is uh, Jody Burstein. And uh, the title for today, uh, of the title of today's presentation is "We Sequence the Legium Genome, So What." Uh, this is the fourth installment of our webinar. So we started uh, uh, in September with Christian Hugh, where we talked about very general perspective about uh, uh, legume, uh, legume crops, improvement uh, and breeding. When, then we went through domestication uh, with uh, Peter Smikel. And then uh, our third installment uh, was with Julia Wittin about uh, seed vigor in general and uh, all things are connected to conservation of uh, seeds. Unfortunately, uh, uh, what was supposed to be our fourth webinar with Dr. Michael Nickerson has been uh, cancelled uh, due to unrelated reasons. Uh, we'll try to recover somewhere in the future uh, our um, Dr. Nicholson um, webinar. So one month uh, we'll probably have two webinars at uh, after just two weeks and not once a month as usual, but uh, we'll still need to make plan for that. And today we are talking about uh, a burning question, that is uh, how to use uh, legume genomes for breeding. So I thank uh, again uh, Judy Borsin for being here and I leave her to her presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm trying to present this. Is it is it fine? Can you see? If the presentation uh, full screen in uh, in this way i only see the presentation with a thumbnail for the next uh, the next slide if you are not able to go full screen i think it's readable it's still uh, so it's still readable it and it's uh, good uh, i'll try again sorry oh. all right sure uh, <laughs> Okay, now we are full screen. Okay, good. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. And um, so dear colleague, I'm very pleased to present you a talk about the present and expected outcomes of the p-genome availability. Uh, so yes, we sequenced the genome, uh, the p-genome, which size and repetitive nature represented a challenge when we started this project. Uh, so we started to build uh, the, the P-Genome uh, P -genome Sequencing Consortium, International Consortium, in 2012. And um, the consortium included different laboratories around the world, which contributed different approaches and competencies. Um, projects were then submitted to funding bodies in order to finance the work of the consortium and the sequencing started in 2013. And uh, finally, we published the, the P-genome sequence in 2019. You can see the, the cover of, uh, of uh, the, the Nature Genetics uh, Journal for our um, issue, giving the P-genome sequence. Um, when we sequenced this genome, I was really surprised by the, 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 the media coverage that we have for this publication, which was amazing, and which is uh, to the level of, of society's expectations for purses, I believe. So you can see here different titles of, the dif of different papers that were uh, published in the, in the in the, in the press uh, about this uh, publication. And so the expectations for P were to revolutionize our diet, uh, were also to save the planet. And, uh, and, and the P genome was expected to help improve crops of the future. So this was really encouraging to see that the, the broad um, public was aware of the role of, of pulses and legumes in, uh, in the future of, of uh, our um, planet. So uh, I would like now to show you some updates on the different results that we published along with the P-genome assembly. 
And so um, in the PGenome project, we used uh, the, the very good uh, synteny uh, that exists among genomes of different uh, legume species to construct an ancestral karyotype uh, of legumes made of 25 fragments. And when we published the p-genome, it was the first legume genome larger than one gigabase to be sequenced. Recently, um, we, uh, two different papers uh, revealed uh, new, new uh, sequences for legume genomes. So uh, the lens culinaris and lens ervoides uh, genomes that are about the same size um, as the P genome and the Vizia Faba uh, genome, which was published uh, this, this year in BioArchive. And so you can see on these uh, on this, um, two pictures that these species, which are part of the Fabae tribe of the Fabaceae, um, show their genomes also show a very good uh, conservation of synteny with the p-genome. Um, you know, we also provided a view of the, of the Pyzum phylogeny uh, based on whole genome resequencing data for a collection of about 40 accession. And uh, so this view of uh, Pyzum phylogeny clearly shows a separation among cultivated peas and wild peas, as you can see here. Um, and it also shows that, uh, showed that uh, um, the other domesticate for uh, um, taxon for Pisum, Pisum abyssinicum, was clearly poly polyphyletic as compared to other cultivated peas. So this was the sta status of, of uh, what we found uh, during our work on the p-genome and in 2022 a very nice publication presented the diversity of a large collection of wild peas as well as some cultivated peas which were genotyped using RADSEC technology and the reads that were uh, produced in this work were mapped onto the p-genome sequence that we had been published uh, publishing. So this work uh, was uh, provided a very useful and clear view, new view uh, on the P diversity, and it uh, uh, clearly demonstrates that um, wide peas are clustered in five different groups. And uh, very interestingly, the, the, the uh, cultivated peas accessions. Um, are clustered uh, among uh, a number of pisum elaceous lines. So I keep going with the different updates that were uh, published since the publication of the first publication of the P genome. A few months ago, um, a new P genome assembly has been published. And uh, this is the genome sequence of a Chinese accession called Zongguan 6 uh, by colleagues uh, from, from China. And the sequence has been built using PacBio um, sequencing, so long read sequencing, and using different technologies of, um, um, sca for, for scaffolding the sequence and a different uh, uh, way also to construct uh, physical maps so bio-nano bio optical mapping and high C scaffolding. So this new uh, p-genome assembly uh, is, is a bit larger than the one that we published on the genotype cameo, and counting size are also improved as compared to uh, what we have been uh, publishing in 2019. Um, so other approaches, tend to improve the p-genome sequence. Looking at the human genome uh, sequencing story, uh, we can see that here that the first draft sequence of the, of the human sequence has been published in 2001, but the complete sequence of the human genome has been obtained 20 years later, so it, it has been published in 2022. And this newly published version of, of the human genome now includes um, 
the highly repetitive uh, sequence uh, and the sequence diverged uh, re recently. And in particular, uh, this new version of the human genome um, was able to provide the centromeric uh, satellite repeat sequences. And so for P, uh, similarly, uh, in, the, in, the, in the two, in the two uh, uh, P genome sequences that have been released up to now, the centromeric regions are almost absent, absent or not well assembled. So the team of Jiri Makash uh, has been working uh, very recently at producing a complete sequence of the centromere of the chromosome 6 of uh, the, the cameo uh, genome. And um, P has a very specific type of centromere, the metapolycentric centromeres. And so this uh, publication that you can see here is um, the first one to present um, a detailed sequence for a, a metapolycentric centromere. And you can see on the, on the right side of the screen, um, the, the composition of this uh, cent centromere of chromosome 6 of, of CAMEO uh, in terms of uh, um, satellite repeats, uh, for example. And so uh, in uh, 2023, we will release a new version of uh, the P-genome uh, uh, of CAMEO. Uh, with increased continuity of chromosome sequences and uh, inclu including curated uh, centromere regions. So I come back to the, the question that was proposed to me for this talk, which was we sequenced a genome and so what? And so what is best, especially for, for breeders? And so um, Having a genome allows uh, for different things. It allows for the identification of numerous markers, which are distributed all along the genome. It facilitates the identification of candidate genes with uh, the, 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 the knowledge of all the genes that are present in the genome. And it thus enables more saturated maps for QTL approaches, more precision for marker-assisted selection, and more effective gene cloning. You can see on this, uh, on this screen uh, a graph that shows uh, um, what was the impact of the publication of the genome of rice on the number of QTLs cloned in that species, so it's the curve in, in blue, and you can see that, that when the draft genome of the rice uh, species was available, the number of cloned QTLs uh, uh, increased exponential, exponentially. And so we hope to have the same in P, uh, and uh, we, we will see uh, that we are just at the beginning of maybe this, uh, this increase. So in P, we have been using the p-genome to detect and genotype um, single nu nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, uh, and uh, in, a, in the frame of a large uh, public-private uh, project uh, called PMUST in France. Uh, we have, uh, since the publication of the genome and since the availability of the genome, we have uh, identify nearly 2.3 million uh, SNPs in P, and we have produced about 1.2 billion genotyping data um, um, in different uh, genotype panels. And this was obtained mainly by using the technology of exome capture. So uh, this uh, technology is presented in the paper that you can show here. So this technology um, used target uh, genomic DNA. You, we used uh, sequences that were um, uh, the uh, sequences of, of expressed genes. And then uh, in, in a number of, of samples of different collection of peas, 
uh, we, we extracted the DNA and we uh, captured the, the, the part of the DNA that was homologous to these uh, target genomic DNAs. And then uh, this uh, capture DNA was resequenced. So this allowed to identify millions of SNPs and to genotype quite a lot of them in large panels. Uh, in this publication, uh, we describe uh, the genotyping of a panel of 239 diverse P-lines. And uh, this genotyping and um, data and, 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 the, and the lines of this uh, panel were then used for a number of uh, genome-wide association studies um, um, for, for different traits. So, for example, um, this uh, data was used to, to, um, uh, to genotype uh, and to detect the loci controlling uh, P resistance to two different biotypes of aphids. And uh, so this work is, uh, is really important in the context of climate change and pesticide use uh, reduction because aphids attack the pea crop and hampers its, its development. There have been a number of other uh, GWAS studies that have been published since the genome publication. And uh, these, public these studies use the genome information either for genotyping or for candidate gene um, identification. Um, Thanks to the genome, we could also uh, develop dense and high throughput genotyping uh, tools that can be used for genomic selection. So here I, I show you uh, the strategy of genomic uh, selection that you, uh, you probably know. So um, genomic selection, in, for, for, for genomic selection, training populations. So it's uh, uh, usually uh, sets of, of uh, uh, 200, 300, 400 uh, uh, P accessions that are used as a training population for which uh, both type of data uh, are produced, genotyping data and phenotyping data. And in the frame of the PMOS project, so we, we used a, a set of, of 300 uh, spring P varieties and a set of 375 winter pea varieties to, to build a training population and we genotype uh, these population using around 1 million SNPs and we characterize the yield of, this, uh, of these uh, uh, collections in different locations in France. And based on, on these two types of information, then we used static, statistical methods uh, to predict the phenotype based on the genotype. And this model of prediction in the, is then used uh, and applied to real breeding population for which genotyping data are produced and phenotype are being um, um, predicted. Then breeders, the choice of breeders for the next generation is, uh, is done based on prediction of breeding values. So we, we are preparing a paper on this, on this work, but there have been a number of, present, of, of papers published recently and until the, the publication of the PGNO that um, show the, 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 the interest of this, uh, of this approach. And so this approach gives very promising results in the different publication that I show here. The, the results were very promising as well as in the PMOS project. But the feedback that we have from our um, reader colleagues is that genotyping costs are still too high uh, for broad use by breeders. And so we have developed uh, new projects in order to try and reduce the cost of genotyping. We can also, uh, so 
Different projects uh, are also ongoing um, in different countries in order to use the genome sequence uh, to clone genes of interest. So I give here the example of uh, a work that is done in the team of Marie-Laure Pilenayel, which has been uh, tr um, starting to find map a major QTL for controlling aphanomyces root rot. And this work is in progress and for, I think, a lot of projects around the world. Uh, we hope to have soon um, QTLs cloned, but um, we are not, not up to, to that point now. Still, we have other approaches using uh, the genome to identify candidate genes, for example, using RNA-seq uh, gene expression profiles. Here, there is a very nice uh, publication that presents a study um, that identified genes um, involved in the control of the development of the inflorescence uh, in P. So coming back to the question again, so what for, uh, so what for breeders? So if we look at the different terms of the breeder's equa equation, we can deduce in which ways, in which different ways, uh, having a genome sequence can help the breeding process. Uh, so the genetic process uh, progress uh, is a function of, of uh, three different uh, parameters. It's a function of the intensity of selection. It's the function of the irritability of the target trait that is under selection. And it depends also on the phenotypic variability available for this target trait. So, um, the availability of the P genomic sequence has led to um, genomic developments which are now make different approach uh, feasible. So we talked about gene cloning or uh, genes that are a good candidate or that control traits of interest. So the availability of the P genome uh, by improving uh, the, 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 the approach of gene cloning will allow to know more about the genes that control the traits of interest. And these genes uh, can then be used um, through reverse genetics uh, to find, uh, to screen ecotypes and mutants populations for identifying new phenotypes linked to new alleles of these genes. And you can see here uh, different pictures uh, showing uh, seeds from a collection of, of accessions um, on the top and uh, um, different phenotypes also uh, associate, associated with different tilling uh, um, mutants. So there are throughout the world um, mutant collections that can be used and, uh, for example, the p-tilling populations that are available at, at Dijon um, could be used for screening and searching for new alleles. Search through this approach, uh, I believe that we can have an impact on the phenotypic variability uh, that is available for breeders to improve the traits of interest. Thanks to the p-genome, we also have now high-density marker maps. Uh, markers that are positioned on the genome, and so it's now more easy to uh, pyramide uh, favorable alleles through marker-assisted um, uh, breeding. And so using dense genotyping allowed to follow gene integration based on marker only, and thus uh, it's possible to test a very large number of plants and just keep in the uh, breeding process, just keep the ones that display the alleles of interest for, um, for a phenotype. And thus, I believe that this approach can increase the intensity of selection 
And so uh, the, this other term of the breeder's equation uh, is uh, improved by uh, the availability of the p-genome. And the last um, example is uh, the, the, the fact that we uh, now have genome-wide markers um, allowed to use uh, genomic prediction obtained from um, uh, uh, prediction obtained from large field, field networks uh, to breed for complex traits. And so uh, in this way, I believe that we improve the irritability of, of, uh, of predictions because the predictions are based directly on the genome and not on plants that are raised in um, varying environments. So to conclude this talk, um, I would like to come back to the p-genome publication. So this publication has received, as I said, a great audience, and we can see now that it has, it has been accessed more than 79,000 times. It has been cited in 213 um, publications, and among these citations, Five were related to breeding, 17 were related to gene cloning or gene expression studies, four were related to QTL or GWAS mapping uh, studies, and eight were related to the study of legume genomic conservation. And so I believe with that with this work that will increase in the future, uh, we will have many of results to be used in uh, in breeding programs, and you can see on the on the right side of, of, the, of your screen um, a cloud of, of the words um, of the titles of the 213 cite, uh, papers citing the p-genome. So what next? So after, uh, after sequencing one p-genome, why not sequence several others? And the technology is, uh, is really uh, improving and, uh, and uh, large um, long read sequencing is, is getting uh, really uh, more, um, more affordable for, for, for P geneticists. And so I think that now we could really envisage um, sequencing and assembling uh, different, uh, several genomes, and so uh, we have put, uh, uh, as a follow-up uh, to the P-Genome International Consortium, uh, we have launched the Peter Pan project for P-International Pan-Genome Project, and this project aims at studying the structural, structural rearrangements among different P-lines in a chromosome-scale pan-genome approach, um, in order to be able to, to, to tackle and to, to study the, the structural diversity of Python genomes, um, namely look at inversions, translocation, duplications, deletion, and insertions. You can see here a very nice example that were published, that was published for Ara Arabidopsis, which, is, which has a, a much smaller genome than P. And we hope to be able to, to, to do the same for, for P. And the outcome of this work, uh, we hope to be able to build a graph-based pan genome. So you can see here um, a sketch showing what we would like to, to obtain in, in P uh, for, for the P genome. Okay, with that, I want to thank um, the different collaborators of the different projects uh, um, I have been uh, um, working on in the last years. And so, uh, collaborators uh, in the P Genome Project, collaborators in the PMOS Project, and now the new collaborators uh, for the Peter Pan Project. Thank you very much. 
Many thanks. Uh, many thanks, uh, GD. Your presentation was uh, uh, fast and uh, very, but full of uh, very interesting uh, informations uh, on uh, on this very very hot topic. I I've seen the outcome. Uh, uh, and I've seen uh, at some point uh, there was uh, a pigenome and uh, I've seen the difference in, uh, in my everyday work as a researcher. Now, uh, we have uh, time for some questions if uh, there are participants that... Uh, so I, uh, I see Paolo, Paolo Nichiarico, which is uh, the president of the Legion Society. And also I see Carlotta Vaspato, which is the vice president. So we have all the big <laughs> figure and uh, Paolo raised uh, his hand. So Paolo, if you want, uh, you can have the mic. Thanks. Thanks, Judith, for this excellent uh, we webinar. Uh, I, I'm very interested uh, as well uh, on ways to reduce the, the cost of markers for, uh, for genomic selection. So I would like to know your opinion about type of techniques, uh, targets uh, in terms of uh, minimum number of needed markers for P, let's say for a quantitative trait like yield or uh, no drug tolerance, and also a little bit the, the, the cost target as a cost per DNA sample. Well, I'm afraid I am not a specialist of this, but <laughs> um, I, if Gregoire wants to say something, maybe he can. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for, for, for reducing the cost of genotyping, what we have been uh, devising, and I see that Bernadette is also present, uh, is to maybe uh, try and define multi-species uh, um, tools uh, so that uh, it's, it's uh, uh, due to the very large number of accessions or samples that will be genotyped on the same tool, uh, the, the cost of this tool could be reduced. So this is one, uh, one option. And, um, and uh, yes, I, I, I cannot think of something else. And for the production of, of DNA samples, uh, really, uh, I've, I've no clue. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, do you think uh, do you think that solutions like what is available in soybean, uh, so with uh, SNP chip that has been uh, somewhat uh, selected and hard coded, uh, uh, that would be a feasible result in the foreseeable future, uh, con considering that SNP chips I have bought the um, the good side is that it's very easy to use uh, and very standardized. The bad side is it's like that. You fix 50k SNPs or whatever it is uh, your target, and then that's it. And uh, if you made some bad choices, so there are a number of, uh, of SNP chips that are available for P already. Uh, the, the idea of uh, using a multi-species uh, chip is to have um, to to broaden the number of samples so that the cost of genotyping is reduced. But um, the, the SNP genotyping, uh, for example, Axiom uh, SNP uh, genotyping uh, is, is, is useful and is, is working well. And, um, and also a, a, an interesting point in, the, in this type, uh, in the use of this type of, 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 uh, of chip is that the there is no bioinformatic work uh, mm -hmm. after, afterwards. So uh, the data are uh, available uh, quickly. OK, uh, I have a question from uh, Bernard Julier, uh, which prefers to write in the chat that uh, the talk is understandable. Uh, she writes, uh, how many genomes are needed to start a pangenome study? How many in your study? So I see that uh, people really want practical information. What they, they want the numbers. Okay, so how many genomes are needed? I don't know. I suppose that uh, 
uh, different uh, teams will choose a different number. It depends, on, of course, on, on the on the money you have to sequence a, a, a genome, and uh, then it depends also on the structure of the of the collection, uh, of the structure of the sorry, not the collection, a structure of, of, of your species and the samples you want to, to uh, the diversity you want to, to, to sample. And so I suppose that the number uh, needed to, to have a view of um, structural diversity when you compare only uh, the cultivated uh, uh, gene pool is more reduced than the the, if you want to target uh, la broader diversity, uh, including the, um, the wild species diversity, uh, wild uh, accessions of the species diversity. And so for, for P, uh, uh, for, the mo for the moment, uh, we, we have not uh, set a, num a final number of, of, uh, of accessions. Uh, we go... Uh, as uh, we, we produce as much as we can, uh, depending on the different fundings that we can have. And so uh, I think that for P, uh, maybe a number between uh, uh, 20 and, 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 uh, and um, between 12, if it depends on the variability you want to screen, but uh, 12 to, to, to 30 uh, would be good, I suppose. But it really depends on the structure of this, the diversity of the species you're working on. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, I see another raised hand from Carlotta Vaspato, Vice President uh, of uh, the Legion Society and uh, one of the original authors uh, of uh, this, uh, uh, this series of webinar. So she, she helped her realize, uh, realize the webinar. So Carlotta. Okay, Judith, uh, just just a quick uh, comment on your presentation. Thank you very much for it. It was really interesting. And I have to say thank you for all the people who work on this first P genome because it is an incredible tool. Also for the people not working directly in P but on related species. So all the people like me that are working on, um, on underused species with not so many resources, like Latirus sativus, we really got a lot of help from this P uh, genome. So that was really, it's really interesting to see that it's not only for uh, the crop itself or the species itself, but it really also helps the people working on related species. And that is making a lot of differences on this species for sure. That was it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carlotta. Okay, if there are, are there any other questions? Uh, nope. It's, uh, so I, I would like to I would like to ask you something. There is a growing interest in uh, uh, going beyond uh, SNPs, and in fact, in the last uh, few slides, uh, you talk about uh, studies about uh, studying in DELs of some form of uh, inversions and transposition and this kind of uh, other vari um, gen genetic variance sources, which have been uh, somewhat ignored because uh, it's easier to work on SNPs. So do you expect uh, uh, now that there are tools uh, uh, that makes easier to take into account also these other sources of uh, genomic variability. Do you expect to just have some uh, incremental improvement? Like in, okay, we, are, we have a slightly better understanding of the genome and that's it, or do you think that uh, something big is hiding in that part of the genomic variability? Uh, I think uh, that there are very useful uh, things that are uh, located in very repeated sequences like centromeres and that these, uh, because of the repetitive nature of these regions, they are probably more prone to uh, um, uh, rearrangements. So that's what we will see in the pan genome project. And um, so it's, um, it's really... Um, um, yeah, I think it's really important. There are a number of publications in other species, and um, for example, in maize, uh, 
uh, identifying important QTLs, uh, which are uh, um, gene copy number, uh, very correspond to copy number variation uh, of genes or, or um, to uh, deletions of some regions of the genome in some accessions as compared to others. And so it's, uh, yes, this type of variation is really important and that's why we think that, so that there has been a number of uh, pan-genome approaches that have been developed throughout the world in different species uh, that were um, actually uh, sequencing using whole genome sequencing, but not using assembly genome assembly, uh, uh, full genome chromosome scale genome assembly uh, to, to, to produce the pan-genome. What we really want to do with our pan-genome approach is really to, to go to, to this uh, scale of, of so that uh, okay. families in order to be able, in a in a range of diversity, uh, to, um, to to see these variation and to use them also. Okay, many thanks. Uh, there's another raise then from Tom Workentin. I hope to have been correct in pronouncing the name. Tom. Yeah, uh, thank you so yeah. much, Judith, for very nice uh, presentation as usual. Uh, my question is, we're working on P and I wonder, can we learn some things from maybe some of the bigger crops that uh, may be a few years ahead of us in this uh, sequencing uh, and genome, uh, pan-genome world? For example, wheat or soybean. Any thoughts about what we could learn? Yes, I, I think we can learn a lot. <laughs> Especially uh, well, in terms of, of approaches, because they are really ahead, and uh, uh, so there, the, 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 there was a, a wheat pan genome published uh, recently. Um, there is also a maize pan genome uh, that is being uh, that has been published. Um, so yes, we can learn a lot, but still um, uh, we have. Um, so, for example, soybean, so soybean pan genome, as far as I know, was not a, a, a chromosome scale uh, pan genome. Uh, but, um, and in the new uh, P genome sequence, the, the, the Zong16 P genome sequence, there, there was also a, a pan genome approach, but which was more uh, of the type I've described. So, it's a, it's a it's not a cro chromosome scale uh, pan genome approach. So, yes, I think we can learn about um, our um, <laughs> I don't know what to say uh, more than what I said. So, we can use the, the, the technologies they have been using the, um, in terms of bioinformatics, but um, and 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 they show the way because they show that there are things very interesting to there are very interesting things to to deep uh, to deep into uh, when we have uh, when you have a pan genome. The the difference also with between so maize, um, wheat, soybean they are not uh, true diploids like pea, and so uh, in this way it's a bit different also. So. But I cannot tell more. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry, Thank Tom. you. <sighs> okay, no. Uh, Paul again, please. Sorry, Judith. Uh, some, something else. Uh, I have some time. Uh, people say, well, we are entering an age. Uh, in which we are going to sequence whole genomes of uh, uh, association uh, study panels instead of, uh, you know, genotyping by array or genotyping by sequencing, etc. And I, I'm not a specialist at all. I, I heard such a statements, you no know, such statements, I mean, with interest, but also a little bit, I felt a little bit skeptical. Now, I, I'm not asking you, I mean, exactly how much would uh, 
such a such an effort cost? Because I, I guess, of course, it depends very much on the on the size of the genome. But I mean, what would be your reaction? Uh, do you think we are very near to this age or we are still pretty far away? Um, you know, I, 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 I'm not I'm not convinced it's very useful. So you see that uh, you see a lot of uh, 1000 genome of this species and 1000 genome of another species. And and uh, I think uh, maybe it's um, well, when the when sequencing a genome will be very, very cheap, maybe it's useful, but uh, and, at the at present, I don't think it's very useful. I think it's uh, it's um, uh, getting a good idea of the diversity present in a, in a species, uh, sampling correctly the, the 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 this diversity and sequencing um, maybe like I said, uh, 10, 20, 30, or as far as what I know from here, but maybe. Uh, then it could be it could be good. Then also there is some people saying, well, we have a source of resistance to such and such pest in this genotype, and we would really like to know what what is in this genotype that creates this resistance to um, to aphids, uh, to uh, brookids, to uh, to um, to salt stress. And maybe in this way, it's it's interesting uh, in order to to go further into the understanding of uh, the genetic control of a specific trait. But um, uh, I think it's really dependent on on the on the cost of of, a, of, of producing a genome. For P, it's still very very high this this cost. And the other. Um, Thing I'm thinking is is uh, um, so we have been developing a lot of, of us have been developing uh, um, uh, genomic selection programs, uh, which was really nice and we can see really that it, it it's uh, it's very useful. But some uh, maybe some other approaches like pheno phenotypic uh, like um, um, some people. Uh, start using also other uh, descriptors to describe a genotype like uh, uh, NIRS spectra, uh, like um, metabolites, uh, profilings, like other type of, of, of phenotyping. And for the moment, I, I have not a clear vision of what will uh, be the, the, the winning guess <laughs> of this. Um, and it really depends on the cost of genotyping or even or sequencing. Sorry, I was a bit long. I'm not sure I, I, I really uh, answered your question, but. Uh... OK, um, I think Paolo doesn't have a, a comment on this. And uh, so anybody else? So it appears that we are coming to a close. I thank again uh, Judy Burstein uh, for her nice presentation. And uh, I guess that this is uh, the end of uh, our fourth uh, uh, webinar. So thanks to all participants. As usual, uh, the re recording will be uploaded shortly on our website. And uh, let's keep in touch. If you have uh, questions and ideas, uh, we are now approaching to the middle point of uh, this series of webinars. And uh, insofar has been a, pretty much a success for our small community. So I thank every all the participant and uh, see you next month. Thank you very much. Bye bye. bye.